Hey, this is Dave McCall, host of the QTS Experience Podcast. And this week, I'm joined by Sandy McMurtry, who helped build the interwebs before there were interwebs. Once upon a time, we used the internet for something other than streaming content. But Sandy and people like him came along to help build the infrastructure necessary for us to enjoy Ted Lasso, Stranger Things, and The Witcher. Join us as Sandy talks about the infrastructure that was built and the future that's to come on the next QTS Experience. The most valuable commodity on earth today is data, how we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. Three, two, one. Sandy McMurtry, welcome to the QTS Experience. Thanks, Dave. So before we get started, Mm -hmm. I have to know, how am I going to get better content rich environment to my devices? I know you know the secret sauce <laughs> on how that all works. Well, before we do that, actually, before you answer that, a lot mm. of our audience may not know who you are, kind of a rock star in our space, but could you just introduce yourself and um, uh, what have you been doing for the last 30 something years in the Okay. Uh, internet space. Uh, rock, spar- rock star is very generous. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I have been around for a while, uh, 36 years and counting in the industry. Uh, I'm an old telco guy. Mm. So I started back in the New England telephone days. Wow. New England telephone, 9X, uh, Bell Atlantic, Verizon, and ultimately, oh, sorry, ultimately they became Verizon. So I was 21 years there. Mm. So I, I try to avoid having a bell shaped head <laughs> too much. Uh, but we used to call them bell heads. All the folks who were there at, uh, I started right after the vestiture. So okay. uh, pretty much before the birth of the internet and right. kind of lived kind of through it with yeah. uh, with Verizon. Um, worked for a small CLEC for about five years and then landed at uh, Akamai nine years ago. So okay. I was nine years at Akamai. So 36 years total. So as you're looking at that tunnel, most of the people that are listening to us, a few of them have been part of building out the internet ecosystem or what we call the internet today. Mm-hmm. Most of our listeners, they use the internet. Mm-hmm. They may even think they understand how the internet works, but probably not as well as they they think. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, uh, th- they can get a super simple answer and they do that. And on the other hand, probably the more nuances they don't know. So if you were describing to somebody who has no, you're standing around in 19, you get to flashback to 1987. Yeah. <laughs> And you're telling some folks about what's going to come. How would you describe what the Internet is? Uh, Wow. Um, So I I tend to very much oversimplify things. Um, So the simple answer is the Internet is a series of connected networks. Right. So I can go back to my my telco days and kind of understand what that means. a network is everything that we touch, right? That has a wire or a cable connected to it. So from the desk on your phone, that you know creates some sort of a network within your building or mm-hmm. house, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to the broader network that uh, <clears throat> telephone companies run. Mm-hmm. It's all networking, right? So what the internet d- does is it allows those networks to connect to each other or is a series of connections of those networks Mm -hmm. so that, and I'll I'll harken back to my telco days, Mm -hmm. if I wanted to pick up the phone and make a phone call on my, let's say Verizon is my Mm -hmm. home company and my home network, I want to make a phone call to you, Dave, who Mm -hmm. was was probably or may still be a AT&T customer. Um, I'm going to pick up that phone and in order for a uh, Verizon to complete that call for me, mm-hmm. they have to be connected somehow to AT&T right. so that AT&T can help complete that call. Right. Now, those the old days, that was a long distance phone call and there was all kinds of money that exchanged hands between each company and all right. that. The internet has really kind of shortened that quite a bit mm. because what the internet has done it's still a series of connected networks. Mm-hmm. You know, we use terms like the cloud. Mm-hmm. And the cloud is really just a bunch of computers that are connected somewhere. Right. They're someone not... else's computer in someone else's building. Exactly. Right. Now, because of the advent of data and not just voice, right? Mm-hmm. We used to do 90% of our stuff as voice phone calls, actually 100% mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. Now we probably, how many people actually pick up the phone and talk very often? Generally, it's now some sort of a data communication, whether it's IM or video conferencing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, 
even a voice call is now a digitized voice call, right? It's, it's kind of, you know, when you say that, I wonder how much money I would save because my kids have no problem texting me, especially the ones in college, right. asking me for money by a text. But I wonder if they'd have the same courage if they had to come see me oh, no. or call me. <laughs> no, no, it's a, lot, different. it's a lot easier, right? In a way, it's kind of depersonalized things. You're yeah. right. But it, but it also has allowed for this tremendous amount of sharing of data, right? Mm-hmm. If you can digitize something in a, in a small format, format Mm -hmm. that can be sent over those same not the same wires because they're no longer the copper. same idea. The, the same idea, right. and connect the data that's on my phone, computer, or or uh, um, tablet, tablet or whatever yeah. to the data that is housed by. Facebook or mm-hmm. Apple or Microsoft or these other companies that have these huge data sources for mm-hmm. us and connect that in a easy way. Mm-hmm. Look at all look at the communication that's increased. So yeah. that's why the explosion of digital mm-hmm. has really increased the use of the internet, number mm-hmm. one, for information and for transaction, mm-hmm. but also just cause the internet to keep growing because mm-hmm. we always find new uses for it. But at the end of the day, to get back to your question, it's really just a series of connected networks, a network being a device, right. a server that is going to be a storage, uh, a method of storing the data, right. and a switch or router, which is a method of directing the data. Right. Right. So. That's really what the internet is made up of, and okay. and as companies work together to connect, that's what that's how the internet works. Now, one of the things that the challenges that we have, and I'll mention, I worked for Akamai Technologies mm-hmm. for nine years. Like I said, the beauty of what Akamai did, and this is Danny Liu and then Tom Layton, mm-hmm. the founders of Akamai, were the pioneers in doing this. They realized that that series of connected networks. Which was really a, go back and say that you know was they, they tease Al Gore for saying he invented the internet sure. right he didn't invent the, the internet but mm-hmm. he and a bunch of other folks got together and crafted the Telecom Act of 1996 okay the Telecom Act of 1996 basically put together the framework by which companies would work cooperatively to connect their networks together okay that's why they say they invented the internet okay we know that it was, <laughs> the internet was already thought of in some never some, underestimate any politician <laughs> it's easy to pick on Al Gore but any politician uh, <laughs> and we've seen that a lot here in the last 10 years claiming credit for just just whatever, but I, I understand what you mean. So there right. is there is a willingness in um, our legislature to say, "Hey, look, how do we facilitate this connectivity?" Exactly. Um, now, one of the you know kind of learnings from that was that companies, yes, agreed to connect. Um, however, there was a, there's a term in the industry uh, back then that would be called best effort. Mm-hmm. So. Back to my example, if I was calling you on my Verizon phone and mm-hmm. trying to reach you down in uh, Florida on mm-hmm. an AT&T line, um, AT&T was going to make its best effort to connect that call for mm-hmm. you. There was not, not much in terms of incentive or penalties mm-hmm. or anything else around doing that. So this best effort method, I used to kind of draw on a whiteboard, you know, the globe, and then just draw a bunch of stri- sprig- uh, uh, scribbly lines around mm-hmm. it and say, that's the Internet. Mm-hmm. It's just a bunch of cables laid all over the place. If you walk around the street, you can go look at them. You look mm-hmm. under a bridge, you can see the mm-hmm. orange fiber, ca- fiber uh, optic cables. You can see the Internet right in front of you, mm-hmm. um, and it's just... You know, an amalgamation of cables all over the globe, wow. up and down telephone poles, under manholes. Uh, and that was then or that's now? It's still now. Okay. So, but that this best effort approach mm-hmm. created what Danny Lewin, one of the founders of, of Akamai, called the worldwide mess. Mm. So instead of the World Wide Web, he called it the worldwide mess because it was such a journey for a a data request to get from one end of the country to the other mm-hmm. because everyone was just kind of passing it along in a best a best effort way. Right. So it's if like you, hitchhiking across the country back in the day. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So one example, quick, if you are in Boston, Massachusetts, mm-hmm. and you would like to download a song from Apple iTunes, mm-hmm. and that Apple iTunes file, that mm-hmm. music file, is stored in Cupertino, California, right. where one of their major data centers is, You that packet could, packet being mm-hmm. that, that data mm-hmm. um, uh, file that you're mm-hmm. trying to download, that could literally 
traverse the entire country to get to you and maybe pass through six or seven other networks mm-hmm. before it gets to my home, mm-hmm. which is, uh, you know, if I'm doing it on my cell phone, it's an AT&T uh, cell phone line. Right. So to get from there to my cell phone in, in, in Boston on an AT&T network, it might have passed through 12 different networks to get there. Wow. Um, what Akamai did was they went to the Apples and the Microsofts and everybody else and said, hey, we can fix this for you. We are going to you're going to be my customer. Mm -hmm. And if you give me permission to replicate your data Mm -hmm. and place some of it in Boston, some of it in New York, some of Mm -hmm. it in Miami, some of it in Los Angeles, Mm -hmm. all over the globe, Mm -hmm. then I'm going to help your users, your customers who are Mm -hmm. requesting those music files Mm -hmm. to get that quicker. Mm Because now me in Boston, Mm -hmm. when I go to download that music file, it's not. It doesn't doesn't have to go all the way to Cupertino, California, to get that request. Right. It might get it from there's a data center at One Summer Street in Boston. Right, and that's going to be a quicker short turnaround. Right, right. so I'm going to have a better experience. The file's going to download quicker for me. I'm going to use it more often. Apple's going to make more money. Akamai's going to make some money from Apple, right. et cetera, et cetera. So really, the concept is very simple. You know, I'm I was a sociology major mm. in college. And I'm still not a technical guy, right? So I was never an engineer, never a software developer, never right. you know a programmer, any of that. Right. Um, so again, the simplification of it helps for me mm-hmm. because it's really just distance equals latency, multiple hands off, handoffs mm-hmm. equal you know potential failure and mm-hmm. congestion and things mm-hmm. like that between networks. So moving that content closer, we used to use the term eyeballs, mm-hmm. closer to the eyeballs. Mm-hmm means a better experience, means more need more revenue, more usage, happy customer, happy revenue stream. Yeah. How, so um, are there, well, actually I was gonna ask a, a different question. Let mm-hmm. me ask this. Mm-hmm. Was that concept well received in the beginning when they showed up to an Apple or whoever, Netflix or some of the other content providers and said, hey, look, we've got, a, we've got this idea. Well, the content providers are thrilled, right? Okay. Because I mean, that's what they want. They they don't want Apple doesn't want to be. Although, <laughs> they in the last few years they've kind of taken upon themselves to do a little bit more of their own delivery. Sure. But at the time when when Akamai first started doing that, they were happy to have someone come and replicate their their files, their data, mm-hmm. and move it closer to the eyeballs. Because again, they knew that their customers would have a better experience and be more, more likely to continue using their products, right? right? So really, that's what it comes down to. I will say um, that some of the battle that was fought over the years, and maybe still to this day, is getting access into the ISPs. Because, mm-hmm. you know, and again, I could go on and on about the Telecom Act and mm-hmm. and, and kind of the, the Bell companies that mm-hmm. were told to break up and mm-hmm. share some of their resources. Um, but, you know, there, there was a natural kind of guardedness amongst some of the ISPs, when I say ISPs, mm-hmm. Internet Service Provider, mm-hmm. which are the people who can provide service to your home mm-hmm. or your mobile device. Now so, most of us think of the, the cable companies, but back then it was companies like MindSpring and... Yeah, uh, and it's still, it's still the you know, Comcast is, Comcast, is a large right. cable company, right? Many right. people have Comcast as their Internet Service mm-hmm. Provider. Um, but AT&T, Verizon, Charter, Cox, CenturyLink, um, right. You know, there's there's lots of them out there. Right. Um, those are the folks who kind of, like you said, own the subscriber. So when you sign up for internet service, mm-hmm. you're calling one of these companies, right? right? You're not calling Akamai or Apple or Microsoft. You're right. calling Comcast or AT and T or Verizon. So some of them, um, you know, the vestiges of divestiture and you know some protectionism around their customer base. Mm-hmm. There was a a mentality out there that in order to access or get connection to my customer, Mm -hmm. you were going to pay a toll. Mm. You know, they they were very guarded around their subscriber base. And, you know, we fought battles for years uh, going back to, you know, 96 and beyond when Mm -hmm. the Internet was created that said, hey, you know what? Like, we're not trying to steal your customer. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to make sure that your customer and our customer are able to have a good experience, whether Mm -hmm. it's a phone call or through the Internet. Mm -hmm. So most of the discussions I've had Mm -hmm. from my, you know, Verizon days and Akamai days were around making sure that everyone feels cooperative 
in mm-hmm. how the internet works. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll hear a term called peering. Mm-hmm. So in It can be different interpretations, whether it's a capital P or a lowercase p. But the idea is um, everyone should peer together. Everyone Mm -hmm. should connect together because, again, your customer is simply trying to either talk to my customer or download a file from my customer. And we want to make sure they're both happy. We're not trying to compete necessarily with you. Uh, We're trying to make sure that the Internet works as well as it can. So this spirit of cooperation and partnership has taken hold more so in the last, you know, just from my experience, I'd say the last five years. Mm -hmm. um, People are becoming more cooperative simply because the Internet is growing so fast. The demand for content and data mm-hmm. is is really at the point where if if companies don't cooperate, the internet will fail. Yeah, which means a lot of businesses will fail. A lot of our economy will fail. Yeah. Um, so I think the spirit of cooperation has grown over the years out of necessity, not necessarily out of. Uh, 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 All of a sudden, the altruism. change of heart. Yeah, altruism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I just feel like this would be great. Well, there's competition as well. So if you're Comcast and your customers complain every time they try to download an Apple Music file, guess what? Your customers are going to go use right. somebody else if there's competition in your area. How, so, what, what do you think has been, uh, you know, we had, of course, the big dot-com mm-hmm. burst um, in, uh, I'll just say 2000, mm-hmm. but in Ish. and around that area. Mm-hmm. Um and then we've ramped back up and it's as if it never happened now. What do you think are some of the big milestones on um, why people have so embraced um, the devices and the tools and the content? Mm. Um, and, and it's changed our behavior so much. I remember um, talking to somebody and uh, they, they weren't answering my calls. So eventually they called me back. I was like, what's going on? And they said, oh, I'm, I, I, I thought you were at soccer practice. I was at soccer practice, but I was finishing this last episode of Stranger Things. And I just started cracking up. They're, they've got their phone They're or their tablet you, yeah. <laughs> at the soccer field, yeah. string, streaming Stranger Things mm-hmm. and having the great, you know, fully engrossed mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. I just was like, this is, we've, we've built all this infrastructure, all this great engineering. So instead of watching my kids, I can watch Stranger Things. Uh, two things on that. So I used to joke, again, I hate to keep referring back to Akamai, but That's all right. uh, we, I used to uh, kind of sit there sometimes when we'd be in, in the room together and, you know, there'd be 15, you know, mid to high level executives sitting, sitting around mm-hmm. uh, planning things. And you know what our biggest game, uh, biggest days were? were gaming downloads. Mm -hmm. So when there'd be a gaming download or a software release from Microsoft, which was also typically a gaming download, um, we'd have to prepare for that. And we'd have to, you know, have, you know, all types of, uh, you know, terabits of bandwidth uh, available pipes. When I say bandwidth, it's just the size of the piping. Um, I want to try to uh, simplify the internet again right. in terms of think of it as a tunnel okay. that's going through. If you've got a thousand cars going through a tunnel and it's sized for those thousand cars, everybody's going to flow through properly. Right. As soon as 5,000 cars go through, there's going to be a traffic jam, right. right? So the internet is all about avoiding traffic jams and making sure that tunnel or those pipes are big enough to handle the throughput. Right. So we used to plan around, well, this is the day, we used to call it day-to-day traffic. So the day-to-day traffic is roughly this. Right. But on a gaming day or day, right. a gaming download day, it could double or triple. Right. So you need to make that tunnel three times as big, even though you're not going to use it every day, you can't build it in one day. So you want to make sure you can't build it sure. one day and then take it down the next day. So you're going to build that tunnel three times as big to handle those types of, uh, those types of uh, throughput Demand, right. those high uh, uh, spiky demands. So that's one of the things. The other thing is we are spoiled, right? The internet has delivered to us such convenience, such privilege to be able to watch, uh, what was the show you were uh, Stranger, Stranger Things. Stranger Things. Or the World Series. We while just watched the World Series. While you're bringing your kid to soccer practice. Right. Is a it's a pretty good privilege, right? So we've all kind of come to to expect that. Now you and I are both old enough to remember when you had the baud type dial up <laughs> on your computer, yeah, and you used to hear that screechy noise, yeah, and it would last for ten or fifteen seconds, and you just yeah. kind of expected it to happen, and you kind of were like, oh, okay, that's what it takes to get on the internet, right? 
there's no way that would be tolerated today, right? Yeah. You, if you if you click a, a screen or a button and it doesn't pop up immediately, you are like, what's going on here? Right. You start pressing the buttons thinking something's wrong, your network's failed or whatever, and soon enough you might just abandon using it right. because there's no way you're waiting 15 seconds yeah. for something to, to load. Um, you know, on that note, just to interrupt for a second, I, you just brought me back to, um, I'm reluctant to... N- date myself too much but I've done it a thousand times on the show but it's um, it wasn't just modems mm-hmm. or the sound of the modems I remember we got a um, a 14.4 modem yeah. and I was like this sucker so fast it's going to leave skid marks on my desktop yeah. and I was super pumped sure. because we would play these we could go to these online uh, uh, user boards mm-hmm. and we would play these games called MUDs mm-hmm. and so basically you're in a te- you know it's a text based you're in a room it's all words you know you're in a room and then the words would change to red a wolf enters the room and other people were in there at their keyboards like mm-hmm. my kids can't even fathom the, they wouldn't do it on their phone right. much less right yeah but the second somebody else got the 28.8 but so it was an arms race yeah. just to get the more powerful modem much less have a modem and connectivity and were you in a decent network where you know and maybe your bulletin board could could only have 200 i remember if you weren't one of those first 200 connections of the night you weren't getting in right so that that reminds me i was just this morning talking to one of our folks who's uh you know selling to gaming companies yeah and i made the analogy the gaming company demands now is similar to the trading market. Mm-hmm. Remember that when the traders first started trading between yeah. you know New York and Chicago, or <clears throat> New York and London, they were demanding the lowest latency routes possible. Right. And companies went out and built, again, back to what I'm talking about, the pipes that were built right. between New York and Chicago or right. New York and London right. were so big that nothing could slow right. it down. With it, minimum intersections. It was just as direct as you could make it. As direct as possible, yeah. as clean a path as you could get. <clears throat> right. Because those traders would lose millions of dollars if they were one millisecond yeah. off of the, the demand. Somebody else, yeah. yeah. And they'd lose a trade, right? right. It could cost them millions of dollars. Gamers are getting to be the same way, yeah. right? Gamers are playing games and they are competing with other folks. There's now you know leagues that yeah. do this. So if your game is glitchy because yeah. and you lose a, a, com- a competitive match, right. you're going to be really upset. Right. The gaming company who provided that may lose millions of dollars or thousands yeah. of dollars, whatever, um, based on not being able to be on a fast enough network and provide a consistent enough service to their customers. We had somebody on Sandy last year. I need to get him back on mm-hmm. or somebody from the industry. So not so much anymore, but in my thirties and forties, like a lot of people mm-hmm. uh, that grew up like me, big online gamer, everything mm-hmm. from world of Warcraft to online racing. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned to you before I got wrecked by John Henry. He, <laughs> yes, um, right. he bought a company called Papyrus that mm-hmm. was out of Boston. Mm-hmm. They made NASCAR racing. And his big idea was to convert it into sport car, sport mm-hmm. club racing, mm-hmm. like all, all kinds of people would love it. That's yeah. his great passion, like racing little Miata type cars. Yeah. And he's since expanded that onto iRacing. He's part of mm-hmm. Roush Fenway racing. Like all, It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. How many th- tens of thousands of people uh, participate in that? And he and I were racing online one time in mm-hmm. these little cars, and he accidentally, he claims, I'm looking at you, John Henry, <laughs> um, spun me into the wall, and then I see flashing across my screen. Sorry, Dave. I can't repeat what I said back, but it wasn't uh, <laughs> as polite as I probably should have been. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, we would get... Um, that was kind of early days. We had a lot of fun. We started off racing on AOL and a thing called the 10 network dial up. Mm-hmm. We get long distance phone call charges for that. And then broadband came in in the form in the beginning, really DSL mm-hmm. and then kind of grew from there. Mm-hmm. But anyway, we would, we would do this gaming. The other day we had somebody on from the industry and they had, um, they were talking about some of the numbers about, uh, online gaming mm-hmm. and how in a lot of in person sport gaming is declining, at least their television mm-hmm. viewership. Mm-hmm. To put that in a c- contrast, the uh, one league of one game, not all the games, not, I don't even know if this is the most popular game in the world, mm-hmm. they had um, 107 million or so concurrently streamed viewers of this mm-hmm. tournament, more mm-hmm. than the Super Bowl that year. Mm-hmm. And in, I want to say it was 2019 
or 2020, but I think it was 2019, the top 15 eSport teams in this league won $85 million. Wow. So much they paid. Um, and in this one tournament, it was a five-man team, mm. and each of those folks made a little over $3 million each for winning this one tournament. So Djokovic wins... Yeah. Three point seven million at the U.S. Open. Mm -hmm. These cats are winning right just under that per team member for this one global tournament. Incredible, yeah. And it's all built on this infrastructure that you've been part of. Yeah, and the other thing that's happening because we are getting, we collectively are getting better at you know, building the internet, mm -hmm. creating the size pipes that are necessary, understanding the demand first of all. Mm -hmm. um, is people are multitasking. You know, mm. um, you know, we used to prepare for the Super Bowl. You know, that was kind of a big event type of day that right. you know folks once the shift kind of happened between broadcast TV and streaming TV, mm -hmm. where more people are actually watching TV through the internet, right? right. You have cable, we do. cable cutters, yeah. right? So you're basically watching the watching the game on TV. And we would, you know, years ago, we would kind of prepare, okay, this is what the Super Bowl viewership was going to be. You kind of thought, well, people gather for the Super Bowl. So there'll be kind of people congregating around one TV right. and watching it. So you could kind of size it that way and figure out what the demand might be and how big it might be. Now it's it's kind of broken up again. Even if people do gather, they're also on their phone That's exactly or they've right. got their tablet because they're you know placing bets or yeah. they're doing whatever as a sidebar yeah. to that. Meanwhile, their refrigerator is also operated from the internet, right? Yeah. And their kid is up in the in their room working yeah. on the internet. So the demand in a household just in itself has expanded so exponentially with the internet of things, right? right. Our, our alarm systems are operating off the internet. Like I said, our refrigerators, maybe right. our toasters. My watch. <laughs> our watches, exactly. Um, so the demand <clears throat> is just there, which again gets back to the central need of localizing that content as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So whatever function, whatever application is going to uh, run through those pipes, mm -hmm. uh, again, back to my analogy, you want to have that right at the end of the tunnel. You mm -hmm. want to make sure the tunnel's big enough, but the data source, you want to be right there. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have to build that highway all the way back to Cal uh, Cupertino, California, right. and then go through this tunnel, because you're going to have to size that, title, that tunnel all the way from California. If I can get the content closer to where it's actually ultimately going to go, mm -hmm. the eyeballs in that region, then I can put that content there and only have to retrieve it that short distance versus going cross country for it or cross globe for it. I remember it. Um, when I moved to Arkansas, I got my first exposure to the folks um, at Walmart. This mm -hmm. would have been, um, mm, gosh, early, late 80s, mm -hmm. early 90s. And <clears throat> You'd driving along in the middle of Arkansas or Kentucky or whatever, <laughs> and you'd come over a hill, and as far as the eye could see, you'd see massive warehouse mm. out in the middle of nowhere, mm. trucks coming and going. And back then, Walmarts were really small, but they were everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they really had mastered this art of distributing J.B. Mm. Hunt trucks mm. coming and going to mm. Walmart, big, massive uh, distribution center. Mm -hmm. And now, just in my neighborhood mm. near Atlanta, I've got an Amazon. They're not out in the middle of nowhere. Right. I've got a massive Amazon warehouse. i got two or three others that are at least, I don't know who they are, but right. at least um, as big as this Amazon distribution center. Mm -hmm. um, and they're right there. Like, they're buying up a lot of the industrial. It's not without their detractors. You know, mm -hmm. we're trying to figure out. This stuff's moving so fast. Mm -hmm. I think we just got to give each other a break to figure out what's appropriate in our neighborhood or not. But I, I'm wondering in content creation, when when you guys were first part of, hey, makes sense for a user experience, and we could take advantage of that. I mean, mm -hmm. why wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. to, to kind of put it out, you know, somewhere between here and the West Coast, right. but not necessarily in the most expensive mm -hmm. data center in downtown Manhattan or whatever. There's, there's some... Um, algorithm or some formula that says this is far enough away to give them an amazing user experience, mm -hmm. but it's in an area that's not that expensive. Right. 
Is that still because you still got to build the pipe and the infrastructure to get from there? So if you're doing this in Toadsuck, Arkansas, or <laughs> not to pick on Toadsuck, I love that reference because I went is one real, time. Canoeing. Is it a real place? <laughs> it is. Oh, I went canoeing on the <laughs> Buffalo River there, and I did not know if we were going to make it out alive. That's uh, a true story for another day when we're not crazy. recording. But Toadsuck, <laughs> Arkansas. Uh, but you know, I spent a lot of time as a kid in Davenport, Iowa, mm-hmm. and um, I don't recommend going there during Thanksgiving time frame because right. it's to them it smells like money. To the rest of us, it just smells like cow manure because it's <laughs> fertilizer season and it'll sure. choke your lungs. But I mean, do you put these content? Um, warehouses at what we would now call the edge and what mm. they mean by the edge is geographically dispersed mm. from mm. you know NFL city hubs or whatever sure. or do you put them near um, a big metropolitan area where all the eyeballs are how do you it's, how's that change that's a great question um, I'll compare it again to simplify it a little bit it's it's uh, I remember studying uh, in in my master's in my MBA program uh, coca-cola Right. Okay. And you kind of go, what does Coca-Cola do? Are they a soda company? Yeah, they're a soda company. But you know what they are more than that is a distribution company. Yeah. Right. They yeah. have a world class, obviously, distribution system. Right. So if you're Coca-Cola, you're going to figure out how far will a person walk for a Coke, right? Mm. A soda. Um, you're going to figure out if I put it here in downtown, I'm going to get so much foot traffic that walks by and mm-hmm. may, may take some of my Coke mm-hmm. uh, or buy some of my Coca-Cola um, versus what about an office building? Am I going to put it on every floor, uh, a dispensary mm-hmm. on every floor, or am I going to put one on every other floor? And will people walk between floors to get that Coca-Cola or will the demand lesson or the mm-hmm. use lesson if I don't put a, a mm-hmm. soda machine on every floor. It's a similar um, exercise, except the, you know, the math around whether someone will walk to a separate floor to buy that Coca-Cola is now, is there enough throughput on the ISP network mm-hmm. to make that user who is in, let's say, Denver, mm-hmm except the fact that that content is actually stored in Los Angeles mm-hmm. and it's 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 traversing somebody's pipe from Los Angeles to Denver if that's good enough then you can kind of mm-hmm. l- let it be mm-hmm. but because of growth mm-hmm. because of potential congestion because mm-hmm. of the importance of the happiness of those Denver customers, yeah. you're going to want to put it as close to those Denver customers as possible. Yeah. Um, so companies like Akamai and Google and Netflix and everyone else who owns content is constantly doing that math to figure out, okay, how when do I go to Salt Lake City, Utah? Mm-hmm. Um, is Denver close enough? Is Seattle close enough? Mm-hmm. Um, you spend a lot of time doing doing that math uh, mm-hmm. uh, with the internet, and some of it is not just Google's ability to deliver, right? Mm-hmm. It's also well, when I when when a uh, Comcast customer in Salt Lake City, I'm sorry, in Denver, mm-hmm. requests that content that's in. Let me, let me, I reverse myself. The con, the Comcast customer that's in Utah mm-hmm. requests that content that's really in Seattle mm-hmm. or Los Angeles, um, and it's on Comcast's backbone then maybe it's a pretty good experience. Mm-hmm. But if it's a Lumen customer mm-hmm. in that same territory, Lumen's network may not be as sufficient, and I shouldn't mm-hmm. pick on one network or the That's other. Right. Just but an example. It will, it will de- depend on the service delivery of that particular network as well. Right. So there's always this kind of constant, and that's why I call it a partnership, right? You're always in this industry, and this is where we come in at QTS as well, is we want to make sure that everybody understands we're here to solve problems. We're here to partner on either end, customer or content end, mm-hmm. to make sure that everybody's working cooperatively. You would like to even co-engineer, you know, you know, co-plan, co-strategize mm-hmm. what's going on on the internet in that territory to deliver that service as best possible. Mm-hmm. It's a constant exercise and you know it'll keep us all employed for a long time mm-hmm. as the internet grows, but that's what it's gonna take in this industry to stay cooperative and stay partnering on those types of things. How do they maintain, how do they keep the content fresh? And I guess what I mean is, you know, I'm in the data center industry and I work for an organization <laughs> who many of whose data centers are millions of square feet. These are not mm-hmm. uh, small. But I'm imagining 
these content or caching locations to be significantly smaller than that. And so a couple things. One, every day it feels like more content's being created. And mm-hmm. I'm just talking about cat videos. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. Paramount's now doing their own stuff. Mm-hmm. And Apple's got their own original con- Like, mm-hmm. everybody is not just content delivery. Mm-hmm. It feels like pretty soon there's going to be an Akamai program out there or Kim mm-hmm. Garrett's or whoever, yeah. right? Yeah. So we're creating, mm-hmm. we're, everybody's creating content. How do you evaluate, one, what content is it that you're going to host mm. in your facility? Mm. And how do you maintain whatever's the most relevant, keeping it fresh so you don't get overwhelmed? Great question. So that is where the genius people come in. That is where the secret sauce comes in. That is where the algorithms that come in and determine based on requests mm-hmm. and demand and you know, ping what we call ping points, which is what's the distance traveled, what's the latency, what's the return uh, milliseconds on storing it here versus storing it there. Right. So I'm glad you introduced the term caching, right? Mm-hmm. So caching is another way of saying storing. Right. Uh, caching implying it's kind of temporary, temporary storage. Right. right. So when you do that. There's uh, algorithms all over the place. I I think Akamai basically pings as many ping points as possible every six seconds. Maybe it's more like 30 seconds. But they're constantly pinging the Internet to, number one, see what the (sighs) return uh, uh, round trip uh, milliseconds would be Mm -hmm. between certain points. And also gathering the demand from certain markets. Mm -hmm. And it can vary by geography it can vary by the types of customers whether they're mobile customers or or um, or, or uh, you know landline type mm-hmm. of customer uh, landline home home based customers mm-hmm. um, into what they will consume mm-hmm. right so uh, let me try to stay relevant here what's the latest thing that's out from the Marvel uh, universe um, oh gosh well they've got uh, the the latest movie where um, <laughs> I can't think of the name yeah of it. I can't remember the name either <laughs> but um, uh, my, my family's all caught up they're looking forward to um, the Wheel of Time series has come out they're okay. looking forward to the Isaac Asimov show on yeah. Apple TV I mean so, just so they're gonna know and and, and their algorithms will help bail this out, what is the popular content, right? Mm -hmm. So again, not to pick on any particular movie, but if they are, the the latest Avengers movie, I'll go ahead and grab that Mm -hmm. because I can't think of the name of the movie, but uh, the latest Avengers movie comes out, they know they're going to need to store that deep close by because there's going to be high demand for it Mm -hmm. versus again, Gone with the Wind or something that may get a request here or there, but that it's okay if that's stored, you know, if the demand for that for Boston is stored in Chicago, we can make sure that it gets there on time. It's not going to be a high demand type of product. So, um, again, the software and the algorithms that go behind computing demand, computing round trip, making sure popular material is up front Mm -hmm. and less popular material can be stored back so that it saves some storage space for the more popular stuff. Um, That happens all the time. There's Mm -hmm. a hierarchical caching that Mm -hmm. happens within every delivery network. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'm curious. Are you familiar with this idea of data gravity? Have you ever heard that before? It's a new term for me. It's been around um, for a little over a decade. But the idea is that, uh, you know, when you have something achieves a sufficient mass and mm. pulls gra- like gravity pulls mm. things to it sure and data sets can get so big mm-hmm. that it's almost impossible to push them along mm-hmm. uh, a network that that you pull the apps to them instead of pushing the data to the app mm-hmm. it's kind of the big idea anyway I'm imagining back in my Walmart analogy um, Walmart did a couple things. One, they make three things. One, they make more of those distribution centers. Mm -hmm. Two, they make them a lot closer to the people, Mm -hmm. not just out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And three, they make them bigger. Mm -hmm. So they're bigger, they're multi-storied, they're closer, Mm -hmm. and there's more of them. Mm -hmm. The content hosters, when when they're hosting this temporary stuff, are there are they expanding their footprint? I know they're going through this algorithm and this evaluation process of what gets stored here. Mm-hmm. But are they also saying, man, we need to expand more. We need to store more. We need mm-hmm. more locations and we need it. Um, or are they pretty much no, it's a con- it it's a constant growth curve, right? So, uh, you know, and obviously you're, you got some finance folks who are going to limit your capital budgets oh, and things like that. People. But there's always 
math into you know demand versus expansion. So by expansion, you're adding more servers to a particular location because the demand is growing at a you know certain rate. Mm-hmm. You're also improving your technology, right? You're getting bigger disk servers, faster disk servers, um, so that you can store more and less, right? right? That's always a challenge at the data center space, especially is what is your density within that data center? Yeah. How many cabinets do you really need to store you know however many petabytes right. of data um, so there's a constant math that happens there yeah but bottom line is it's always kind of up and to the right mm. the internet really demands it at this point yeah. you know servers uh, server locations are going to have to get bigger more dense power demand is going to grow right as we see so um, I think it's a it's a little bit of both I think your question is do you keep growing that one center or can you offload what you're delivering today in Dallas by opening up, uh, you know, a, a pop as we call it, a point of presence in Houston? Right. Because a lot of the traffic in Houston is yeah. going to Dallas. I mean, right. it's coming from Dallas, right? right. Um, so again, companies like Akamai are constantly looking at that and figuring out, okay, what are the other geographic cities that we you know, sometimes poo-poo and call them tier two cities. Right. They're not tier two. Houston is the fifth largest uh, city in the country, it's right? Houston. They can't even win a World Series. So. <laughs> but there's a lot of people there. I'm so, actually flying there uh, tomorrow, so okay. I have a great deal of affection for Houston. <laughs> Just teasing them. Don't let them win a World Series, though. <laughs> uh, but no, I uh, yeah, so I think, again, that's something that, uh, you know, happily keeps us all employed for a long time. There's a lot of engineers, a lot of planners, a lot of uh, network architects working on this stuff on a constant basis. What's, um, I'm curious to get your take on it. feels like, so we've been talking a lot about content storage mm-hmm. and this idea of... Um, Placement. So, mm-hmm. where would I put um, a storage site based upon um, you know the 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 capacity of it to host who what eyeballs it's serving or users that it's serving mm-hmm. um, its ability to uh, distribute? And I got talent locally that can maintain this. It it's one of the things that's fascinating to me, and I don't understand it well, is it seems like the world when we say the internet that um, it's moving so quickly. There's not just more content providers, but it, this world of network and content is just getting mashed mm-hmm. together. How are you seeing that play out? Uh, completely, it's playing out. And some of it's through you know corporate mergers and acquisitions, right? Mm. Comcast owns NBC, mm. uh, AT&T owns HBO. Right. Wow. So I didn't know that. I believe I got that right. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, so you know they are now a eyeball network, right? And also a content right. producer, right? right? So you know they're going to do a lot of that on their own mm-hmm. because they can do it through their you know uh, uh, video on demand services mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. their customers who buy their cable services yeah. or whatever. Um, but they're also still going to have to work cooperatively because they don't have uh, you know the they they want they want their product to be consumed by non Comcast and AT and T customers sure. as well, right? So right. they're going to have to work both as a content provider and a content delivery company at the same time. And that's what's that's happening as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you kind of have, again, it's back to my point that we're not competitors. We're not really customers of each other. We are at a certain level. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we're competitors, sometimes we're customers. But the bottom line is we need to work cooperatively to make it all work mm-hmm. either way. Um, one of the things that we used to say at Akamai when they'd ask Tom Layton, you know, who's your biggest competition? Mm -hmm. He would often say, it's our customers. Mm. Because our customers will figure out, Netflix was a huge Akamai customer when I first got there. Mm -hmm. Netflix figured out how to do their own delivery. Mm -hmm. So they are a CDN that connects directly to or provides their content directly into Comcast, AT&T, Charter, and everybody else Mm -hmm. on their own. And, you know, you would think that a company like Akamai would be saying, oh, what a big loss. It's really not because, Mm -hmm. in a way, Akamai couldn't have handled all of the traffic on the internet anyway. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no data center can house all of the throughput that needs to go into a particular metro either, right? That's right. So, again, instead of viewing each other as competition, I think it's all just complementary. And, you know, there's enough money and enough, you know, throughput that everybody can get a slice of the pie if they perform well. But performing well is really the biggest part of it. If we can all make the internet work properly, there's enough for all of us to go around. Yeah, it, it's 
it's hard to imagine being in one of those, whether it's Akamai or any of the content delivery folks, and you're you're kind of I got my little piece of paper here, mm. and I'm you know I'm charting out this this graph mm. of growth mm. and where is it going to go, and you just keep drawing up and to the right, oh, yeah. like there's no um, we've got satellite, you know, Starlinks being built. We've mm. got sea cables everywhere. We've got um, home appliances mm. that are, you know, my microwave yeah. now can talk to me and ask me what kind of bacon do I like just on and on. In fact, sometimes there's, you know, I get a little nervous about how much my house knows about me, but yeah. you know, all of these things going on, um, I can't help, but when I get internet infrastructure people in here, mm. sort of the, I'm not gonna say the dark side, but the but the risk is for all of this connection that we're talking about, there's only a dozen or two massive routers that if those were impacted, at least that's what I've heard, is these are impacted mm, okay. um, that the that you know, if I lost um, the carrier hotel in Chicago, if I lost the couple carrier hotels in New York City, if I lose the couple carrier hotels out in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. Most of Apple's, uh, I'm sorry, not Apple, Amazon's AWS infrastructure are near those or over in Santa Clara, right? That's mm -hmm. just five geographic locations mm -hmm. and the big, massive uh, routers and infrastructure there. Do you think that's much ado about nothing? We're not that vulnerable or we are? Oh, no, I, I think we. It, it would be a major outage for any of us that would be experiencing something like that. However, you know, traffic will get through, mm -hmm. right? It may just have to revert to the worldwide mess and take a circuitous route to okay. get through. But you, as an as an end user, will eventually get that file or get to you know download that or, or you know access that website. Right. Um, it just may take longer. Or you may get a you know, yeah. please try again later if it's yeah. if it's a super serious uh, event. Um, but again, some of that is balanced with the fact that, yes, we're very spoiled, right? We're yeah. not used to waiting. Um, so I, I think the way, at least I know that the most of the companies that I have, there's multiple paths. And, right. a lot of, and most times it's self-healing, right. so to speak, in that if New York went down, you deliver it through Boston or, right. or Ashburn and vice versa. Um, so... You know, you, it may take a little longer. It might be a little bit more glitchy, but it'll get through. Yeah. yeah. Well, I like optimists like you. So if, when we're when you're looking at um, not with your QTS head on, you're mm -hmm. now at QTS, not mm -hmm. not Akamai, but mm -hmm. you're just an expert in this field. Uh, sometimes you've got to just start laughing. Like, is this for real? Like, this is <laughs> crazy. Um, it almost feels like early days of. I don't know, back in when GE ruled the world or IBM ruled the world, mm. although this is an industry, it's not a particular company, you know, right. just wild, like just almost like um, being a wildcatter when we're discovering petroleum, like just just opportunity risk, yeah. um, sometimes mistakes, but opportunity is all over the place. If you look at the next five, 10 years, what are the things that are really interesting to you about, wow, how are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to work through or what what are some things that really are engaging you? Hmm. Great question. Um, I wish I had all the answers for something like that. But, you know, from a from an operational technical standpoint, you know, I wonder, you know, you know, how, you know, how, how much can we shrink the storage, uh, you know, into devices. Yeah. One of the things that, you know, is that comes to mind is, you know, at what point does your cell phone become a caching site. Where I, somebody was just talking about that, that yeah. it would be the AI and the caching. Yep. So, you know, obviously there's some hurdles to get over to make that happen. Yeah. But whether it's your cell phone or a set-top device in your home that you watch TV from, right. you know, there's the thought that, you know, can we at least store the most popular things, <clears throat> the things you access every day right in your cell phone or mm -hmm. your or your your uh, TV now mm -hmm. obviously there's privacy issues there's uh, competitive so to speak uh, proprietary um, software issues if you right. put a client on a phone are all the mobile phone providers going to allow you to put a client on their phone right um, you know things like that that will have to be overcome that's where I, what I think about what I wonder where it's going in five or ten maybe not not as much as five years yeah um, you know, where, how, do, how much do we reduce um, kind of the storage capabilities, uh, 
you know, extra uh, being distributed and can we distribute it straight to your phone or, or other device? Um, the other thing, quite frankly, is, you know, what are the social ramifications and where are we going to go as a society yeah. right, around the use of data, the use of the Internet, the storage of the Internet, the information that we put out about ourselves and is accessible by other people? Um, you know, what are the fraud implications uh, with all of that? That'll be a determinant as well, because mm-hmm. I think there'll be some collect corrections that will happen there mm-hmm. where, you know, uh, just because you can do certain things, you maybe sure. should not do yeah. everything, right? I mean, think about, you know, the baby yeah. monitor or the, or the the refrigerator, the smart refrigerator, right. uh, where people are concerned, you know, can someone listen in on my private conversations? Right. Is you know, So there's a lot of that that's going to determine, you know, where we go technically with the Internet as yeah. well. Um, you know, how do we socially engineer that? Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think there's a lot out there, plenty to contemplate, uh, lots for people to debate. Um, you know, technologists will continue doing whatever they can do to, to deliver uh, and cash things as locally as possible. Uh, large companies will continue to try to do uh, the exercise that I talked about before, where it's like, okay, how do we serve this base mm-hmm. in Salt Lake City or mm-hmm. in Cleveland or whatever? Mm-hmm. Um you know, trying to figure out how to just kind of go about the standard build outs that will happen. Um, but it's easy to predict and say, look, we're very quickly or actually already have, in my opinion, gone from in the U.S., the nine major metros to what is really probably more closer to 20 to 22 major metros. And in five years, is that 30 or 50 major metros uh, where we have the need for large infrastructure, large caching, large pipes in and out. Um, because the demand is just going to keep uh, multiplying. So do you guys think of the edge differently than what a lot of the pundits will run around and they talk about the edge, the edge, the edge? Try, and usually what that means is a small data center or mm-hmm. a small mm-hmm. data set, mm-hmm. um, you know, not in a, in a major metropolitan area, but mm-hmm. further out. At least that's what's implied. Yeah. Right. Um, although my data center in downtown Atlanta is the edge for all of those people right, right. there. Yeah. Um, how, how did, how would you if, as a CDN think about the edge? So there's companies out there that are offering those types of products already. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, I don't, I won't name them, but there are companies that are doing this kind of, um, I'll call it micro edge mm-hmm. type strategy where instead of, you know, a data center in downtown Dallas, mm-hmm. let's have 20, micro centers around the Dallas area. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds super intriguing, Mm -hmm. but I can tell you from an operational standpoint, again, back to the what's good enough, Mm -hmm. because if you're gonna put 20 sites, that's 20 more potential points of failure. Yeah. 20 more things you got to pay for hardware and maintenance and people right. to go out and fix when they break. Vulnerability right? points. The vulnerability point. All of that is introduced as well. So, again, I think every company is kind of doing the math on, you know, where is my sweet spot for right. serving that? Uh, and it, how quickly do I need to get to the point where I'm in 20 different locations in Dallas? Right. Uh, that would be... I think we'd rather see it in the phone at that point yeah. uh, than to have to actually be in 20 different sites. I, I had somebody on um, a few weeks ago and they were uh, they were talking about, we're talking about AI in particular. Yeah. But, but as it relates to um, content, they were like, look, we, there's a lot of energy or a lot of conversation about putting machine learning and AI in end devices mm-hmm. instead of core devices, mm-hmm. or at least some some portion of them mm-hmm. uh, in, in these devices. And that way we can, you know, we can distribute it this way. The challenge with all of that, of course, is, well, we don't have uniform devices. Right. We don't have uniform mm-hmm. uh, privacy and security. And so h- how we work through that and, and sort of the overall challenge is this, it's just moving so fast. Yeah. Things are moving so quick. Mm-hmm. There's social things that are changing right around us where we've had and many times not even getting it right, millennia, if not centuries, to work through different social injustices and things. And all of a sudden, we've got right around us things changing in a decade. (laughs) And we're trying to keep up with that, much less technology. And we want to take advantage of the things, um, you know, that bring 
uh, about human flourishing, yeah. but not expose ourselves to more risk because there's always people looking to exploit. Yeah, that's where the the warning kind of comes in from the social side. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Black Mirror, but oh, uh, yeah. if you watch that show, it's it's kind of scary, right? In terms of uh, what technology can drive us towards, right? Yeah. Um, so again, I think there's going to be probably some correction on those things to avoid. Um, but you know, the bottom line is folks are still going to want. Uh, high demand, quick response, uh, access to as many applications or products or banking records or whatever they want in mm-hmm. their daily life, they're always going to want it at their fingertips, right? We're kind of beyond the point of return mm-hmm. with, with those things. Um, so as they grow, we're going to have to answer the call and make sure that uh, they're able to do it. You know, things as simple as a bank, and now we're going to offer multiple services through their websites, not right. just check your balance, right? Now you can pay bills. Who right. knows what you'll be able to do in the future, you know, right. pull down a mortgage and all those types of things. Um, those are things that, you know, are going to continue to be a demand uh, for for, uh, for the industry to keep now, up I just with. imagine that data lived at the bank's at their, in their data center, wherever that might be. Mm-hmm. A lot of times it's in a data center like ours, they mm-hmm. may have their own, although that's less and less. Mm-hmm. Would that be the kind of data that a CDN would cache? Would they cache that kind of data? Well, I just imagine them caching videos or games. It'll it'll vary, right? There's okay. certain personal information that will be cached. Right. There'll be certain balance information that might be able to be cached, depending on the relationship with the bank really? and everything else. I have else. no idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to, right? Because right. it's once you, well, again, caching being temporary, right? right? If I go into my Bank of America page yeah. and I click away from that page to check my mortgage balance or right. something, when I come back to my checking account balance, I want it to still be there. Right. So it's been cached right. for some period of time, right? Right. So but is yes. it cached on your phone or is it cached at a, not, not to pick on Akamai, but a company like Akamai it's, at their thing, or is it just sitting there waiting for me to refresh it from Bank no, of America? It'll, again, depend on the customer relationship uh-huh. between Akamai and, and my example, Bank of America. But yeah, it's likely cached at Akamai site so that it didn't return all the way right. to wherever the uh, So that just made that was. site a hundred times bigger than what I imagined it because oh, I yeah. just thought it was... Again, temporary though, yeah. right? So as long as you're on the page or in the app, right. you, it's going to stay there for you so it doesn't have to you know, take a long refresh. Once you're off of it for, you know, again, I'll make it up, yeah. 10 minutes, a half an hour, right. or whatever, it'll go back to back home. How soon until all our neighborhoods are filled with whether they're micro or macro sites for all this caching. Cause I'm just imagining in my house how everybody's using data for it. Like literally if you go to my laptop, I'll have 10 or 12 tabs, not uncommon, right. have two or three YouTube things running on different speakers mm-hmm. or whatever. I might have in the background Hulu streaming mm-hmm. with a sporting event or mm-hmm. something like that going on. I will have my, corporate travel thing open Just, like, like that's not an uncommon and it'll remind me of something and I'll pause a couple other things and I'll pull up a could be anything from a sermon to disc golf to right. who, you know what's Sandy's schedule and when's he going to be in town <laughs> right all of that is well or some portion of that is being cashed I mean when And that's just me. Yeah, well, you're talking about the growth of the internet, right? So you've gone from 256k to now you need a gigabit speed at your house, right? So which I have, right? 95 (laughs) gigabits of speed. But I just mean that. I mean, it's some of that, you know, data. I'm just curious. You know, we're trying to ask ourselves this question. We're what's called a core data center. Mm -hmm. So usually, very, very big data centers at or near the big infrastructure hubs where there's big power and Mm -hmm. you know. Um, access to uh, heavy duty um, core infrastructure stuff. We, we I don't want to sp- you know speak for future events, but it would be we're not generally moving into a um, just sort of a random uh, mm-hmm. you know we would not be in Des Moines uh, anytime soon necessarily, mm-hmm. but. Um, Probably sooner than you think. Maybe, uh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, that's, I mean, that's you're making that point. Yeah. I mean, generally, we're going to be in an NFL city or a European city kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just feels like if we're talking about this kind of growth that very quickly, almost reminds me of like central stations. You know, mm-hmm. once upon a time, there was a central station mm-hmm. in Chicago or whatever. Mm-hmm. But as electricity got more and more adopted and everything converted to electricity in terms of tools and appliances and whatever in your home, it all runs off of it. 
the, the substations, all the mini stations, it all it just grew and grew and grew. Right. Do you think it's similar to that or for sure? Okay. Yeah, for sure. I mean, again, I, I think the the uh, the quest for the ability to cash. Mm -hmm. And also to parse what needs to be cashed too, mm -hmm. right? So there's also math that's going to take place on, you know, what are the really high demand, uh, high performance things that we need to cash? Uh, CDN's going to ask themselves that I need to cash local, like really locally, mm -hmm. versus again what can fall back in the hierarchy on delivery mm -hmm. uh, because it's you know just a web page that's mm -hmm. not that frequently uh, asked for versus you know here comes the Super Bowl right mm -hmm. um, so that that is a constant thing and again it's all based on what we think the customers want and what they will demand and what they will put up with in terms of you know the mm -hmm. glitchiness or the delay or lag that might mm -hmm. happen when they when they try to access it um, so this is really why you have these companies out there figuring it out all the time mm -hmm. you know trying to figure it out all the time and it's a constant changing landscape one thing that's happened for sure is our uh, the demand model has become a lot more spiky right because of all the potential downloads of software right. because of the potential uh, viewing of um, kind of event mm -hmm. type um, content that's mm -hmm. out there. What would be an event like the inauguration? You got or an inauguration, the, those right. types of things, which are somewhat predictable, right? right. If you're a forecaster or a planner right. within any organization, you're right. going to know that you know the first Tuesday in November is going to be the right. election. Uh, the Super Bowl is going to be sure. whatever uh, Sunday in February. You see those coming, but now. You know, even just something that happens in the news, you know, right. a verdict comes out in a big trial. Sure. All of a sudden, everybody's on their device trying yeah. to watch the video yeah. for it, right? So you've got to plan for those types of things, too. So things are less predictable. You know, some of forecasting you could kind of predict it was going to be up and to the right and it's rather smooth. Right. It's always going to be up and to the right, but now maybe it looks more like this, yeah. you know, day to day or week to week. Yeah. Um, so companies have to plan for that um, and understand that from you know, kind of makes their caching needs a little bit more nimble, right? Yeah. And more re having to be more responsive to those kind of spiky demands. I'm curious, um, two, two questions, answer them in whatever order. And I don't, I'm going to ask the first one, and I don't mean this as a, um, like a nationalist kind of idea, but I'm wondering, in America, do we do this the best? Or are there other countries that do, mm. that are really committed to caching? And so, for example, when I think about esports, South uh, Southern Korea, South mm -hmm. Korea, mm -hmm. it's a huge culture over there. It's mm -hmm. on television networks. That long before it was streaming, you could watch StarCraft tournaments and all kinds of stuff. This has been going on for decades, mm -hmm. and so broadband access. Now it's a mostly homogeneous world. Mm -hmm. It's a small place. Mm -hmm. It's you know nowhere near the complexity of the United States. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are surprised that countries like South Korea have really distributed their infrastructure pretty good. But America seems to have, you know, usually the biggest budgets and the most, we have uh, obstacles. I'm just curious in your experience, are we the leaders in this area or are there other? That's a great question. I can't pretend to know the full answer on that. But I will say that, you know, a lot of it is going to depend on the infrastructure that was in place, the legacy in infrastructure, right? Mm. Even here, mm. we're still dealing with le uh, legacy infrastructure in many parts of this country. Yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned GSL, which for people, yeah. uh, you know, you're still kind of operating off of copper. The right. old phone lines oh, yeah. are still being used to deliver Internet service in some parts of this country, yeah. uh, in the more mountainous areas. Um where it's difficult to yeah. go back and lay new fiber. So that's, you know, that's going to be a restraint no matter what country you yeah. are talking about. If you go to places like India, mm -hmm. where it is an older infrastructure that mm. is, you know, they spent the last 20, 30 years trying to upgrade it, but it's mm -hmm. a lot of work for a lot of and people. And it's a huge country. And it's a huge country, Very exactly. Very difficult terrain. Versus, you know, uh, Africa, Western yeah. Africa, which never really had much of an infrastructure to begin with. So they got to kind of take a little bit of a head start into wireless. So uh -huh. the infrastructure in countries in northern and western Africa mm. are generally wireless and actually very good because it's the newer technology right. and it's all wireless. They don't have to worry about, you know, downlines as much as we do here. Yeah. Um, so that type of thing drives how the internet performs in certain countries too right. and the reliance on it, right? right? If you're in northern Africa, everything you do is going to be basically wireless demand and therefore it's going to be 
you know, high performing yeah. relative to maybe some of ours. Um, and that's the technology that it's based on. So a lot of it, it will will depend on that, you know, what we call the last mile, right? right. The, what, what comes to your house or what comes to your device, your device. A buddy of mine, absolutely hysterical, just moved back from Thailand. He moved to Florida, just outside of Ocala, Florida, mm-hmm. has essentially no internet at their house. Didn't even occur to them to check. They're yeah. waiting for Starlink to show up. Mm-hmm. They're just a little community, just mm-hmm. maybe five miles outside of whatever the, you know, they can get, they can get uh, a little bit of a 4G on their phone yeah. and then try to stream something through that. They're like, what? When I was in Thailand, I had at least gig speed yeah. at this little uh, community I worked with and lived at. I come back to Florida, you know, no mountains, yeah. easy peasy, you'd <laughs> think. No, no, uh, no connectivity. Very unusual. Yeah. Again, it's going to depend on the investment that's been made by the local wireless or landline companies in the, or, or cable companies in that territory. And some of them are either rough terrain, soft terrain, or, yeah. you know, other, other kind of geographical challenges to get yeah. those things out there. We have a lot of Martian gators, I guess, in this place. I, I, I don't say, know. I'd be like, well, then you got to move. Yeah. I don't know what your problem I was is. Say, where do you bury five? Yeah. there right yeah. where do you build a tower there so yeah, um, yeah no it, it's it's funny even New York City I mean until you know uh, the advent of uh, kind of 3g I think it was 3g I forget which which generation finally uh, the earlier wireless networks wouldn't go through iron buildings right? right so if you were in the middle of Manhattan you had very difficult time using your cell phone. Right. You'd actually have to go to the window and right. hope maybe it would come through. If you were standing in the middle where the elevators were, or on the elevator, it would never work, right? right. Um, so even now, that's still a bit of a challenge. Yeah. So. Uh, my fi- I'm not an expert in this area. My 5G buddies tell me, look, there's a lot of potential. 5G is going to be amazing for a lot of things, but there are still a lot of... Um, opportunities for improvement of figuring out how it's going to penetrate buildings and mm-hmm. how it's going to work and a number of these scenarios. Mm-hmm. They're very bullish on it, but it is not just a, oh, we just flipped the 5G switch no, and we're all, no, no, we're no. all running. My yeah. last question is, and I thank you for being very uh, kind with your time today, and we'll talk again in a few weeks where sure. I'll have a much more detailed list of uh, get you questions. <laughs> okay. But I'm curious, when you're talking about you know, the, the experience that users will put up with, mm. Is it also studied what demographic, either by content type, so people that are downloading movies are more patient than people that are waiting <laughs> on games, or is it by gender, or is it by age, oh. or do you have any particular, like, boy, we better not irritate boy, that's a this great. group of people. <laughs> I've actually never thought of it other than... Um you know, probably hearing my kids swear and throw their <laughs> controller across the room when they were having a problem. Yeah. Um, I don't know that an adult would necessarily do yeah. that if they were trying to watch a movie. Um, but no, I, I don't know if that data exists, but certainly uh, just generally, right? Like yeah. we started in the beginning, uh, we've been spoiled in any kind of delay. I know even myself, I think I'm having trouble actually here. I have AT&T yeah. for my cell phone service and then I had to switch to the Wi-Fi because my cellular wasn't working right. very well here. And I was like, what's going on? You know. Right. So I think we're all just kind of spoiled in that direction. The, the other side of that, though, is, um, you know, my experience is that when you are able to deliver the right service to people and they're very happy with it, they use it a lot more. Yeah. I know that when we were forecasting certain geographies, we'd say, you know, we're going into Denver and we kind of sized it at a certain number of gigabits or terabits of capacity. Um, we were always underestimating it mm. because once we were able to kind of improve performance in that territory, right. The usage, you know, doubled or tripled yeah. um, because people were just so happy that they actually stayed on their devices longer or watched TV longer. So it's really the inverse that you want to shoot for, right? The yeah. positive growth that happens when you improve performance. Um, as far as people being unhappy, I think a lot of people, a lot of people will get frustrated, and a lot of people will be on the phone to their yeah. to their customer service. Uh, and, and this is one kind of ironic thing is, you know. Uh, uh, again, I won't name the company, but there was one particular ISP where, you know, we were talking about, you know, being more cooperative. We're not here to threaten you. We don't think we should pay you to help you help your right. users have a better experience. And they kind of, you know, acknowledged that when their users have a bad experience, they call their customer service. Because if you're at home sitting there and you're 
service is slow, mm -hmm. you're not going to call Amazon, Google, or Akamai, right? right. You're going to call whoever your right. service provider is. Um, and they were doing the math on how much those calls cost them, mm -hmm. right? And it's a tremendous amount of money they spend servicing or taking mm -hmm. those customer complaints. So they don't want it from that perspective either. And they also don't want people, you know, uh, right. quitting and going on to their competitor. Yeah. So, uh, again, I think it behooves us all, whether we are a ISP, mm -hmm. whether we're a data center provider, or whether we're a content provider, to make it all work, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we're here for at QTS. I think we want to message out to folks that, hey, we understand how this works from here to here. Mm -hmm. We happen to be in the middle, but we don't want to get in the way. We want to make it work as best possible. Not only do we not want to get in the way, we want to facilitate, to your point about partnerships, uh, we want to partner with them all, right? We, yeah. how, how do we how do we bring in the right uh, mix mm -hmm. of connectivity? Right. And we have a seamless and easy transaction for them to service their clients, mm -hmm. and we just uh, uh, facilitate that. John Offerhead, who you can talk about, talk with the next time we yeah. talk. Uh, he he uses the phrase, "I'll steal it from him, buffet." Right? We want to create a buffet that has all of the best in, uh, foods and things that people want to eat yeah. and have it available in our building. Yeah. And we want people to come to that buffet. Yeah. Well, that's probably a good place to end it because <laughs> I am built for a buffet. <laughs> so, Sandy, thanks for joining me today. Thank I really you, appreciate Dave. it. And I look forward to our conversation in a few weeks. Thanks again. Thank you. That's Welcome fun. to QTS. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. All right, everybody. <laughs> if you've enjoyed the program, please like, subscribe, share, and comment. We'll see you next time on the QTS Experience. See you, everybody.